that's the big kahuna. You know, we're celebrating the coming and what God is about to do. You know, we're celebrating the time before the cross. You know, it's Palm Sunday because we, you know, we read in John chapter 12 and it says, so they took branches of palm trees and went out to, to meet him crying out, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, even the King of Israel. The anticipation of the cross, the anticipation of what the cross is, the blood that was shed for you and I. That at, oh, when God said it is finished, he covered everything from that point for all of eternity that we could be one with Christ, that we have the victory in Christ, that we have the love of Christ within us, the power of Jesus. And then three days later, there's a plot to us and he raised again. But this morning, let's fix our eyes on Jesus, the author, the perfecter of our faith, for he is so good. Let's sing Hosanna to him because he deserves the praise, the honor, and the glory. So Jesus, Lord, we fix our eyes on you this morning. God, we ask you, Lord, would you come have your way in this room? God, we ask, Lord, would your presence blow through this place? God, we ask you, Lord, for, for a fresh pouring out of your presence, God. Lord, would your praise always be upon our lips? So God, we ask you, Lord, would your will be done this morning? God, we thank you, Lord. We thank you for the cross. God, we thank you, Lord, for what you've done, what you're going to do. Jesus, Lord, we love you. We worship you. In Jesus' name, we pray.
hearing in my spirit over and over that maybe today that you are surrounded in darkness. Maybe there's darkness on every side and all you can see are the waves crashing around you. Maybe all you can feel is the wind in your face and you're saying, God, when is it gonna let up? When is my breakthrough gonna happen? But we serve a miracle working God, one who is able to raise those from the dead, one that is able to speak life back into a body, open blind eyes, open deaf ears to provide everything that we need. All we have to do is reach out. When Peter stepped out of the boat and he walked on the water, Jesus beckoned him to come. And when he walked out, Peter got distracted for one moment. He took his eyes off of Christ and that's when he started to sink. And how many times do we take our eyes off of Christ in the middle of our circumstance and we start to sink into fear, into despair, into confusion, into doubt. Know that this morning, God is speaking life into the middle of your circumstance even if you don't see it he's working even when you can't see it he's moving we need to begin to worship and praise him in the midst of the storms that we are facing praise him when we can't see an answer praise him because we serve a miracle working God I know Kathy's going to walk. I know she's getting feeling back and she's progressing and her spirits are even doing better. But we need to keep interceding for Kathy for a complete work because I serve a God who doesn't do things halfway. God is going to complete what he has started in Kathy and God is going to complete what he has started in your life. Many times when we feel darkness around us, God's saying, rise up, my child. Rise up in strength. Be strong in the faith. And we talked about this a couple weeks ago, that even in the scriptures, we see those that cried out and say, I believe, but help my unbelief. What is one of the best tools that you have to fight unbelief? You start to worship God with everything in you and unbelief, doubt, Fear has to go in the name of Jesus and faith rises up. Faith is birthed inside you. You get into the word and you start to declare what the word of God says over your situations and you watch God turn things around. Come on, let's sing that one more time. Go from the bridge, please, even when we don't see it and declare over your circumstances right now that even because my natural eyes cannot see, my God is at work.
you have for us, oh God. We thank you, in Jesus' name, amen. to come back. Amen. Are we excited for that day? Amen. Well, good morning to those who are watching us on social media and good morning to you, First Assembly of God. Um, I'm glad you are here with us to celebrate the triumphal entry of Jesus. And many of us have had heard this story before and many of us have read it and, and we've gone over it in our minds. And, but I, I want to take a look, a, a different look at it uh, this week or this time. I want you to put yourself as a reporter Back at this time, now many of us have been in parades or seen parades, and you know I've been in both. I've watched parades and, I, and, I, and I've been in a parade. And all that you see sometimes in parades is you have news media and you have reporters that go around and they ask, "Well, what do you like about this? Or what do you like about this? Or are you excited to be here?" So I want you to put yourself as a reporter back in downtown Jerusalem, at the time Jesus is walking into town on on the colt. What would you have written in your in your article or your on your social media page? What would you have said? Would you have given the truth? Would you have gone around and asked questions to other people? Why are you here today? What are you going to write down? What were you going to ask the people as they call out Christ? Hosanna, Hosanna. Then let me ask you this question. Would you ask the same people at the end of the week, who cried out, Hosanna, crucify him. What changed in your heart? What, why in the beginning of the week you're praising God, you're worshiping him? Because when you lay down the, the palm branches, it was a time of victory, a time of celebration. 
People were screaming, yes. But at the end of the week, the same people are saying, crucify him. Would you been have the boldness to do that? To ask these people, what changed in your heart? In the same perspective in our lives, what changes in us? We praise him on Sunday, but Tuesday something happens at work and we're cursing him saying, God, where are you in the midst of my storm? We find this story, though, in, in, the, in all the Gospels. We see it in Matthew, we see it in Mark, we see it in Luke, we see it in John. And today we're going to be in John, the book of John, because I want to give you three points that we can pull out of this that, that help us today. Something that happened thousands of years ago can help us today. So let's turn to the book of John. We're going to be in John chapter 12. We're going to just read uh, from 12 to 16. And many of us have heard the story. The next day a large crowd had come to feast, heard that Jesus was coming to Jerusalem. And so they took branches of palm trees and they went out to meet him, crying, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Even the king of Israel. I need you to hold on to that because it's probably the first time that they've ever recognized him as king in the public eye. And Jesus found a young donkey and sat on it, just as it is written, Fear not, daughter of Zion, behold, your king is coming, sitting on a donkey's colt. His disciples did not understand this at first, but when Jesus was glorified, then they remembered that these things had been written about him and had been done by him. Let's pray real quick. Father, I ask that even today as we break open your word, Lord, that I would step out of the way and that, Lord, your spirit would speak and speak to the hearts of the people what you're trying to say to us today, even in this time. We thank you, Lord, that we have the freedom, Father, to come together and fellowship and, and worship you. And, Lord, we don't want to take that for granted or we don't want to take that lightly. Father, we're excited for what you're about to do in this, in this world and in our lives. Now, Lord, I ask you to give us boldness. and let, Lord, let our ears be un, un, um, unclogged, Father. Let the distractions be put to the wayside so, Lord, that we hear your spirit clear. And we thank you in advance. In Jesus' name, we pray amen. Now, the stage is set. The curtain rises up. The final act of the drama begins. Here comes Jesus in this, the city of Jerusalem. People crowded on narrow streets on a holy city. At Passover time, garments were spread on the road. Branches from the trees fanned the same air which shouts, Hosanna. Jesus, the Son of God, the long-awaited Messiah, has just arrived. Prophesied by the prophet Zechariah many years earlier. Zechariah 9.9 9 says, Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout aloud, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, your king is coming to you. Righteous and having salvation is he, humble, mounted on a donkey, on a colt, the fowl of a donkey. Now the prophecy of Zechariah was just many that were foretold the coming of the Messiah, the good shepherd, the Lamb of God, who would sacrifice all for our sins. The one who would be our salvation. These prophecies were all fulfilled. They are part of history, factual information, which is our belief that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of the living God, the second part of the Trinity. So now I want to give you a little bit of background so you understand the triumphal entry a little bit different this year. Yes, we know he's fulfilling prophecy. We know he's, he's doing what the Father's plan is to, to bring redemption to mankind. But I want to give you a little background of Israel and God's relationship and how Israel's need to change but God's faithfulness even in that time. So I want to share three points with you today. Save us. Fear not. Not as we expected. Now, the first point I want to share with you is it says, God save now. Hosanna. We read that in, in the verse 13 of chapter 12. It says, so they took branches of palms and they went out to meet him crying, Hosanna. Now, Hosanna, most people think it means praise God, but it doesn't. Hosanna actually means God, or really, now save now. Around the first century, the church decided to make it say praise, it's an act of praise or worship. But actually it says, save now. So in other words, they were saying, crying out, save now. Can you remember when you were, first came to know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, what did you say? Save me now. Save me, Lord. Deliver me. Save me. The excited crowd shouted, Hosanna in the highest. Hosanna means, save us. Save us, Lord. In the Aramaic and the Hebrew, original cry for help. 
When you say the word Hosanna, there's an emphasis on the na. Save now. How many of us have faced storms in life and you're saying, God, I need you to move right now. You emphasize the now because you're in a place of your desperation. You gotta understand, when he was coming to town, they had a different perspective. We see it from, we see it because it's, a, in a sense, we're looking back. They're, they're in the midst of their storm, right? Rome was over them. And they needed a conquering king. So let me give you a little background. Let's go back in the Old Testament. In Psalm 118, the psalm begins by a call of worship. It says in Psalm 118, verse 1 and 2, it says, Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. For his steadfast love endures forever. Let Israel say, his steadfast love endures forever. Now, we can agree with that, right? Go down a little bit more in verse 22 through 26. It says, The stone that the builders rejected had become the cornerstone. This is the Lord's doing. It is marvelous in our eyes. This is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Save us, we pray, O Lord. O Lord, we pray, give us success. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. We bless you from the house of the Lord. Now, regardless, it is clear that the people wanted salvation on their mind, whether it was in the book of Psalm or it was in the Gospels. Now listen, in the Gospels, the people understood the king had come to bring salvation, but they were confused on what kind of salvation Jesus, the king, was about to bring. See, they, were, they wanted a, a leader, and they knew he was a leader. And they wanted him to bring their country to former glory. They praised God for giving them the king, because they acknowledged him in the scriptures, our king. However, they were blinded by Jesus' true mission. See, these are some of the things they faced that we didn't know. Put yourself in their position. You see, the people wanted an insurrection to topple Rome. They wanted Rome out. A person that takes an armed rebellion against the authority. Jesus did come to defeat an enemy, but not the one in their mind. Instead, he came to defeat the enemy of sin that ensnares every man and woman. He came to fulfill the Father's plan of salvation. And like us, when Jesus is moving in our lives, in our situation, or our challenges that we face, and as soon as he doesn't respond the way we feel that he should respond, our attitude changes. And normally we express it with bad attitudes and the things that we say and do. Isn't that the truth? God, I need you to move. And he moves in a certain way that prospers you, makes you better. You're like, oh man, I didn't want it that way. Here's another psalm I'm going to talk, take you to, Psalm 107. Now, the psalm speaks of a time when, when there was adversities and, and God had delivered his people. The psalmist tells us how God continues to care for his people, whether it's for food, guidance, water, um, saving them from their disobedience, storms at sea. But whether it was back then or today, God still rescues those who follow him and cry out to him with a genuine heart. So let's go to Psalm 107, verse 4 through 9. And then we're going to go from 10 to 13. It says, Some wandered in the desert, finding no way in the city to dwell in, hungry, thirsty. Their soul fainted within them. Then they cried to the Lord in their trouble, and he delivered them from their distress. He led them by a straight way till they reached the city to dwell in. Let them thank the Lord for his steadfast love, for his wonderful, wondrous works to the children of men. For he satisfies the longing soul and the hunger soul, hungry soul. He fills with good things. Let's go to verse 10 through 13. Some sat in darkness and shadows of death, prisoners' affliction with irons. For they had rebelled against the words of God, and they spurned the counsel of the Most High. So he bowed their hearts down in hard labor, and they fell down with none to help. Then they cried to the Lord in their trouble, and he delivered them from the distress. But how many know when you read the Old Testament, and you're probably asking, why are you giving us all this background? Because I want you to look at at, at when the triumphal entry comes. Because it's just them repeating their lives because they refuse to obey God and walk in obedience. But do we follow that same pattern? See, in Psalm 107, we, as you re- continue to read that passage, God is not rebuking them for crying out to them. But he's saying, listen, why can't you praise me in the good times and only in the bad times? Why can't you call out to me when things are going great? 
Why is it that I have to be having problems before you call out to me? And how does that relate to us? Do we call out to God on a daily basis, praising Him and thanking Him for His goodness and His mercy? And His love, love is never ending. It's always there. Or do we only wait till, the, till we come in their problem, that we have struggles, or then we call out to God? When we read the Scripture, it gives us the answers to how we can live a life better than they did. See, we see them crying out in the Gospels once again. Go back to John chapter 12, verse 13. So they took the branches of palm trees and they went out to meet him crying, Hosanna, save now. Do you see the history in the past? The enemy would come against them. They'd cry out to God. He would deliver them. Once again, they, they would go again and again and again. And here we see the triumphal entry. And they're thinking Jesus is coming in. He's going to kick Rome out like he did in the Old Testament. But they were wrong. We see, here see Israel crying out, For God, God, help me in his captivity. Get rid of the Romans. But they changed it to crucify him a few days later because he didn't do what they felt that he should have done. For the church today is those, have we become a church of more griping than surrendering? Have we forsaken prayer for complaining? See, it's easy for us to look back at the story and make comments, but... How would we respond if we were with them? Our country has never experienced in that way a foreign leader sat in the White House. We've never been in occupied territory. We've never been a country under siege. You don't see China or you don't see Russians. If you see that, you'd be a little more defensive. God, help us. If you've seen uh, Chinese military walking down your street or uh, airplanes flying over your house, you'd be crying out and you'd be on your knees, God, save us. Save us now. Do something, God. Why have you forsaken us? And this is the same thing Israel went through and the same thing we do every day in our lives as a, as a people, not just as in this church, but as a, as a community. When is it going to be that we give everything over to God? You're saying, well, pastor, I didn't want to hear this kind of sermon. This is really just beating on me. It's just the truth. Understand, they are crying out for freedom. They experienced captivity as a people for a long time. For us, we know he caved to save men and women's souls that have eternal life through him. For those who follow him and choose him as Lord and Savior. But we haven't been in their position. God rescued me in the midst of my storm. Save me, Lord. Jesus, save me on my terms, not yours, though, is sometimes what we say. God, I'll come to saving knowledge, but I'll, you know, I'll let you in my heart, but I'm still going to sit on the throne. See, we can have Jesus as Lord and Savior. You can have Jesus as Savior. And we just have Jesus as Savior. That means he doesn't, he doesn't have the Lordship in our heart. We don't let him sit in our heart. We don't allow the Holy Spirit to speak to us. And this is the problem that God's people are going through. They were stuck. Number two, second point I want to look at is fear not. John chapter 12, verse 15 says this, Fear not, daughter of Zion. Behold, your king is coming, sitting on a donkey's colt. Now, this is one of the most frequent spoken commands used. Fear not. But it's a, it's a positive thing. You know, it's a positive thing, not a negative. Fear not. I am God. In other, in other words, place your trust in God. How many know that we sometimes let fear into our lives? We let fear clog our judgment. We make bad choices, right? But God's saying, fear not. I'm here. I'm here in your life. If you're a believer in Christ, you have the Holy Spirit living inside of you. Why do we fear? Even when you look at the first scripture in the book of Genesis, what's it say? In the beginning, God. Who? God created the heavens and the earth. If I'm a follower of God, if I have a relationship with Jesus Christ, and I have the power of the Holy Spirit living inside of my heart, when I get fearful, go back and read that scripture. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Why do men and women fear of what's happening in our world today? Is there a doubt that God's going to answer your prayer? Is there a doubt in your life that God's going to help you? Is there a doubt That's something we have to soul search. 
Even with everything going on in the world today, God got this. We need to be looking for opportunities to share God's goodness, his gospel. Share the story of God's faithfulness in your life and in my life. Continue to pray for those who are in fear and locked up in their homes. There are still people who are so fearful they're staying in their homes. They're not going out. Or they're choosing to pick or choose where they go. Ask God to give you boldness to reach out to all those who are around you, your neighborhood, your community. God is opening doors all over the world. We need to pray, what is our part in our little community, in our neighborhood? Step out in boldness to witness to people around you. Today we have the lamp that's lit. Praise God. Praise God. Now, we talked about God save us. We've all done it at one point of our life. We cried out, Hosanna, God save us. And he was faithful when he did it, and he was immediate. Then he talked about God, we fear not. we got to be in a place where we understand that God's in control. There's nothing in your life that God does not see, does not hear. He sees everything that's going on, that we need to rest in him. Remember Proverbs chapter 3, verse 5 and 6. says, trust in the Lord with all your heart, and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him. And he will guide your paths. He will, because why? You follow him. You listen to what the Holy Spirit is saying. To fear not. No matter what the world brings. And everything that's going on in the world today. Fear not. The third point I want to talk to you about is this. Not as we expected. Verse 15 says, Fear not, O daughter of Zion. Behold, your king is coming, sitting on a donkey's colt. Now, Jesus came not how we expected him, amen? They didn't either, right? Kings kings came in on uh, war horses, not a donkey. Now, if you think about how big a a horse is, and then you see, say say a horse is this high. Okay, I'm just making this up. And then say a donkey's a little smaller. Now, I understand that the colt is is the child, so he's a little bit smaller. So you think about Jesus sitting on the colt, his feet are probably dragging on the ground. He didn't come in the most, when, 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 when a conquering king comes in, they, would, they want to be seen. So they'd get the biggest horse in the land. And they would walk prom, or ride promptly throughout the countryside. They want people to exalt them and, and praise them and, and, and a powerful leader. But Jesus came on in a colt. And honestly, his feet could have been dragging on the ground. Donkeys were not huge. But he's bringing justice and salvation, but on a colt. Now, Matthew spoke of how he brought the mother of the fowl. Both came to Jesus. This meaning this little guy here. It was pretty interesting. It makes sense that, that the mother, um, that they brought the mother with the baby. So the baby would probably stay a little calmer. Think about it. Matthew 21, verse 2 says, Saying that I'm going to the village in front of you, and immediately you will find a donkey tied with a coat on her, with her, untie them and bring them to me. It's an interesting story. So he knows he rode the little guy. Jesus presented himself as king. Conquering kings rode horses. Jesus presented himself as meek. He was quiet. He was gentle, easily imposed, and submissive to the Father's will. Jesus presented himself as being humble. He was not proud, haughty, arrogant, or even assertive. So understand how Jesus came into town as the conquering king. Jesus was coming, but not how, they, not how they expected him to. They wanted someone to save them from their temporary problem, not the eternal problem. How many of us were like, yeah, Jesus, just save me. Get me out of jail, and then we'll deal with the rest later. Or Jesus, help me get out of debt. And, you know, we only use him for what we can get out of him. But they were looking for the now and not the later. They wanted a temporary answer. Jesus was bringing a permanent solution to their problems. What king do you follow? What king do you cheer for? What kind of king is he in your life? Call it the first century or the 21st century. The picture still remains the same. Your king is coming. So let's take a look at this king. Number one, your king is a different kind of king. Now in America, we don't have a monarchy, but most of us would probably... Uh, usually watch the, the, the over in England, that the, the, the monarch over there. Many of us have probably seen when J- Charles married Diane. I, if I remember Diane's dress, the train of her dress was probably longer than our sanctuary. But we're fascinated with that. How many young ladies here want to marry a prince? 
And how many men want a queen or a princess? Well, ladies and gentlemen, you're stuck with who you married. <laughs> but we're fascinated by that. The royal wedding. And we're always watching, and we're glued on TV. Oh, look at how beautiful she looks. Look at the dress, and he's so regal. And look at the horse-drawn carriage, just like in Cinderella. But it didn't turn into a pumpkin. And we'll even occasionally follow at a distance the royal gossip surrounding the monarch. Prince Charles and Diana and Camilla. Diane dies. Camilla, he marries again. Then Prince, uh, Prince William and Kate. And lately in the who's Harry and Meghan and how they gave up more than they'll ever know for their children's destiny, which changed because of their decisions to step out of the royalty. I think their first son, is it Archie, is the only one that will be left a, in the royal lineage. And any of their kids afterwards, nothing. Could you imagine giving that up? See, you have a royalty, you and I, with Christ Jesus. Don't give that up. We'll talk about that in another sermon. But today's world, we're seeing the weaknesses of kings, prime ministers, even presidents. It is sad, but it's something that's in commonplace in our world. How much of our leaders are falling, even in the church, leaders are falling to sin. It's sad. But see, there's one exception. Being in an encounter with Jesus Christ, he's a different kind of king. Where most royalty comes to determine to rule, he came to serve. Whereas most monarchs spend time building their egos and their prerequisites of office, he came to totally disarmed in humility. Whereas most kings rode on white stallions or majestic, a.k.a. Boeing 747s, Jesus rides a donkey. Most kings set themselves up a hero's death. It says in Westminster Abbeys of their imagination, they pictured the heads of all the nations standing in silent tribute and the world paying homage and honor to their contributions to the world. This is what kings think about today. When a king dies today, most of the world leaders will go and pay their respects to the family. And they'll look at their accomplishment and praise them, or, or they'll, they'll talk behind their back later. But they will go and show their respect. Jesus was different. He, prepared, he was on the cross, which was a public disgrace, a kind of death. His fellow monarchs did not fly around the world to pay homage and honor to him. No, for your king is a different kind of king. Number two, your king knows precisely who he was and who he is. Most kings aren't certain about themselves. In most cases, they have inherited their positions. With their inheritance comes either an uncertainty bred by failure to earn a position or perhaps on another extreme, a kind of bravado or strutting that comes from years of grooming by the palace instructions. I remember, I remember there used to be a movie. This is eons ago. Um, probably about, I don't know, 30 years. I think it was called King Ralph. I think it was John Goodman played. I don't know. He was a, a criminal crook from Gambler. And the movie started that he was part of a, a, a generation of, of um, royalty, but like 100 people down the line. Well, one day there was a... a they were taking a family photo of the generations of the king of the royalty, and they all died. They all got electrocuted. He was picked. So they had to groom him. He wasn't the average king. It was a comedy. And it kind of really messed up at the end. But most kings aren't prepared. Jesus was prepared. Jesus knew precisely who he was. He knew that he was the Messiah spoken about in the Old Testament scriptures. Jesus dressed for the occasion, preparing himself the kind of an entrance in Jerusalem described in Zechariah, as mentioned before. Those prophets declared the Messiah would come, and he would be one different from the average king. This one would be humble, making his entry on a donkey. His triumphal entry in Jerusalem was designed to seal his doom. It was a Catholic agent that would stir up the anger and arouse the jealousy of the religious establishment into a frenzy, setting the stage for the greatest event in all of history. And we're going to celebrate that next, next week, his resurrection. That should bring great joy to your heart, knowing if you're a believer in Christ, you have access to the Heavenly Father 24-7. Not only did your king precisely know who he was when he entered into Jerusalem, 
Now he even knows when he enters into your hearts what you need. Number three, your king comes with compassion for souls. It says, only after his triumphal entry into Jerusalem, Jesus wept. Have you ever seen a king weep? Have you ever watched a president shed tears? Years ago, a presidential candidate disqualified himself from a primary election after he cried publicly. Then later you can see on any kind of social media that the Bushes, the Clintons, the Obamas, the Nixon, even Eisenhower, they all wept. Us in America, we don't want to see our rulers weep. We want them to be strong. We want them to stand firm and, be, and, and look for fierce. Because when we weep, it's a sign of weakness, people believe. No, Jesus was different. He stopped and he wept for Jerusalem because he knew it was about to happen. He knew it was about to happen to them by Rome, and he knew even of the rejection of his own people. Matthew 23, verse 37 says, Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the city that kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to it. How often I would gather your children together as hens gather her brood under her wing, and you're not willing. This Jesus healed broken bodies, blind and lame, freely walked. These people, simple people, the people with broken bodies and shattered dreams, the people with bruised spirits, those who hurt to the soul where you can really feel that hurt, he took these people on. He did it then and he'll do it now. This is the kind of king that we want. A king that doesn't close the door to you. A king that doesn't say no to you in a sense. And when you cry out, God, help me. He wants to transform your life through the regeneration power of the Holy Spirit. He wants to touch your lives and make you a whole person, body, soul, and spirit fit together. Amen? How many of us could use a, a good talking from Jesus today? How many of us could use a touch even today? Number four, your king comes sounding note of judgment. It'd be nice that if it's just all love and, and, and cake and ice cream kind of stuff, but there is a judgment coming, and Jesus is bringing it. He's the king who has compassion, but his compassion is not to endeavor to buy you his favor or your favor. He's not going to give you everything you, you want. He's not going to deny his own righteousness. He tells you what you need instead of what you want. He tells you that someday you will stand before God, your maker, accountable for that. All that you've done in your life, he warns of judgment. He warns of eternal hell, total alienation and separation from himself. And there are some that will face God on their own merits at the great white throne of judgment. Those who reject Christ in their lives. I don't want to be them. As a believer, we will stand before him in the Bema seat where we will answer for what we did with what God gave us as believers and how we lived our lives. That's going to happen. But how many know that God is a gracious and merciful God? That his throne room is open to us 24-7. That he gives us ample time and he loves us. But he is a just God. Now, do you ever pick a scripture that you really like you really don't want to see or happen that brings you fear? What are some of the scriptures that bring you concern or fear? Now, Romans 3.23 says this, for all have sinned and fallen short of God's glory. We all know that, right? It's, it's, it's commonplace. Romans 6.23 says, for the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. So we know that as sinners, we know how to get out of this is through Jesus Christ. But two that really bother me sometimes is this, Romans 14, 12. So then let each of us will give an account of himself to God. Now, there was a couple of scriptures that, that says, even the one, I think it's in, it's in Matthew, and it talks about, you know, de depart from me, you evildoers. I know you not. Those, when you understand what that scripture means, it's talking, he's talking to people who aren't truly believers. But I'm a believer. And in Matthew 12, 36 says this, I tell you on the day of judgment, people will give account for every careless word they speak. How many of us said some stupid things in your life that you'll answer for? I wonder some of the words that I say as a believer in Christ. I wonder if some of the things that I've, I've said, and, and I'm like, oh, man, I'm going to answer for that one. But I know that he's a gracious God. Amen? The king who enters Jerusalem on a donkey walks on the foot side of the hill. 
From his perspective, overlooking a city he loves, for which the city he wept. He refuses to give a campaign speech, as any earthly leader would do. He tells Jesus, tells people like it is. Instead of telling he says this. He says, listen, you're going to have domestic breakdowns. You're going to have economic catastrophes. You're going to have wars. You're going to have rumors of wars. You're going to have earthquakes. You're going to have famine. You're going to have horrible desolation, which, I, which you and I will bring upon ourselves. This is the kind of king he is. He tells you and me what we need to hear, not just what we want to hear. He talks about more than positive thinking. Oh, it'll be okay. You can do it. Pull, pull yourself up by your own bootstraps. He tells us, you can't succeed ultimately without me, without me. You can't make it. Your king is coming. and He approaches. He demands your response. The next statement is true, but it's hard. He says, buckle down. You're either with him or you're against him. When we all stand before him, it's just going to be you and him. That's it. Are you, are you ready to meet him now? Because your king is coming. Hallelujah. And he's coming back for his body, the church. Amen. You know, today we sing Hosanna, Hosanna, which means save now. Do we mean that when we sing the songs? Do we come just to fill a pew? Or do we come to celebrate the King of kings and the Lord of lords? Do we celebrate what he did for us and, and that we can have life with him forever? Do we celebrate the stories in our lives with other people? And do we tell the people around us, listen, it may look gloomy, but God is with you. And God will help you. Are you serious about your relationship with Jesus Christ? Because when he marched on that road, the people were serious. They were screaming, God, save us. But at the end of the week, their whole attitude changed. Have you come here today just because it's a nice thing to do? Or are you watching today because it's a nice thing to do? Or because you're here because you mean business? I challenge you this day to search your hearts. When we cry out in our lives, Lord, save me. Is it just for a temporary situation or solution? Or is it something eternal? If you're a believer in Christ, your eternity is set. If you have not made the decision for Christ, there's no, never, or there is no better time than today. I can tell you the times in my life where God has rescued me from things I thought I could never get out of. I can tell you the times when I felt like Peter drowning and God reached his hand down. And even he says, oh, you little faith. And he picked me up out of the thing that built my faith right there, knowing that God was in the midst of my storm. And that even though that I made a bad choice in my life, he reached down and grabbed a hold of me and said, I'm going to rescue you because you called out to me. And even though that my life wasn't perfect, every time I called out to God, he rescued me. He pulled me out, but he walked me through so that I would learn that I would not do the same thing over and over again over again and that's what Israel was doing and that's where they failed because every time God rescued them he said listen I am here I am your God I will take care of you but they rejected him and when he marched down the town he was like I could see it Why? He, sitting on that donkey this is just me going down he's excited but he knows what's going to happen his own people reject him I don't want to be in that place I reject God. But I can tell you here as you listen where God had taken me from point A to point, I'm glad I'm not where I'm at. And I can't wait to see where I'm going. Because I got the grace of God, the mercy of God, and I got the Holy Spirit inside of me, breathing on me daily, saying, listen, here's what's best for you. Here's the decisions you make. And we got to be in a place as the body of Christ to hear what the Holy Spirit is saying. What king do you serve? Do you want to serve a temporary king where he's going to just meet, you, meet your, your problem right there? Are you looking for a king who's going to help you through all of eternity? What is your perspective? What do you want? You, have to, you and I have to decide. Have the worship team come up.
I know this wasn't the normal triumphantly cheerful speech where we come in and we're all excited and we're waving palm branches. But you lay the palm branches down in your heart for Jesus. And then you're picking them up, complaining to them because of the problems that are in your life. Are you seeing God as your deliverer? Is your faith being shaken for what's going on around you? Then I challenge you to do this. Go back and read the first verse in the book of Genesis and how God created the heavens and earth. And it's the same God that walked on the earth. It's the same God that went on the cross. It's the same God that was raised on the third day. Can you see how he rescued us? Jesus has so much in store for us as, as the body of Christ and as individuals. Are we willing to pay the price of what God has done for each of us? There's people all around us that need Christ. Someone planted a seed, and now someone's life is now with Christ. Church is serious stuff. Church is serious stuff, or Jesus is serious stuff, not church. But being the body of Christ, we have responsibilities. But if I don't trust, if I don't have my faith completely in God, how am I ever going to do what he asks me to do? If I'm a fearful Christian, I'll, never, I'll be stuck. If I still live in the past, I'm stuck. I can't. If I'm living in the past, I'm never going to go to the future. I'm never going to really get what God has for me if I'm stuck where I'm at. If I'm only serving a God for a temporary solution, I'm never going to get to where I need to be. God made a way so that we can have access to the Heavenly Father. Jesus willingly went to the cross for each one of us. What are you going to do with what he did? That gift he gave you, the gift of eternal life, what are you going to do with it? The choice is ours as a body of believers. Amen? When we, when we, when we, as we leave this place, not just say the words, Hosanna. Really praise him from a genuine heart. And yes, when you go out this week, you're probably going to have some stressful situations in your life. Say, God, how are you going to get me through this problem? And believe. And then believe and walk it out and see what God's about to do in your life. The enemy will come after you, us. But are we going to stand firm? Amen? Let's sing praises to his name.
the darkness, my God, that is who you are. You are here, touching every heart. I worship you. I worship you. You are here, healing every heart. I worship you. those same voices that stood along the road and shouted Hosanna that cried out save me 
Just like my husband said, we're after a temporal fix. How many of us find ourselves looking for a temporal fix? I'm gonna ask that every head be bowed for just a moment, every eye closed. Jesus wants more than just a moment with you. He's looking for an eternity with you a relationship, a daily relationship where he's saying, come. He stands with his arms open wide, welcoming us. He went to the cross for us. And today I want to make sure that every single one of you in this place has the opportunity to know Jesus as your personal savior. You know, my husband mentioned about the lamp being lit. We are celebrating the fact that there are three that are now counted in eternity because they took a step. But there might be some in this room, even this morning, or some watching online that have never taken that step. And maybe that's you. And I'm going to ask, without anyone looking around, if that's you, and you're saying, today I'm taking a step, I either want to give my heart to you for the very first time or I am rededicating my life to Christ today. That I'm not after a temporal fix, but I'm after a permanent assurance of knowing that my eternity is sure with Him. If that's you today, I'm going to ask that you would make eye contact with me. If I don't see you, lift your hand. Amen. Amen. And if that's you at home, know that all of heaven is rejoicing with you over the decision that you have made today father god we come to you this morning lord we repent of our sins lord we know that we are in uh, that we are sinners in need of a savior and that's why you sent jesus to the cross none of us are perfect Father, this morning we offer ourselves to you fresh, new. God, even that this holy week, Lord God, would be so profound, Lord God, in our thinking that we wouldn't just breathe through just another week, but God, that we would take moment by moment the accounts of what you went through for me, for us, oh God. Lord, I thank you for those ones that have given their lives to you whether it be this week or this morning. God, I thank you. I thank you that we have access to the throne through you. I thank you, God, that because of what you did for me, that I am now a child of, the, of God. I am no longer a slave to my sin, to my past. God, we celebrate Father God, we cry out with purity of heart saying, save us now, O oh God. Hosanna, Hosanna to God in the highest. Save us, O oh God. Today and forevermore. Oh, Father God, we bless you, Lord. We praise your holy name. And with one voice we would say, Amen. Amen. Listen, next week for Easter Sunday, there is no Sunday school. We are, however, having a breakfast. Please make sure you sign up. The sign up list is out in the foyer. Put your name down so we know how much to prepare for. We're having a traditional style breakfast with pancakes and eggs and bacon and sausage, some good stuff, right? But you can't fall asleep during service. So come get your bellies full, but make sure you sign up. May God richly bless you. Don't forget, we have Wednesday night service. We have Good Friday service at uh, 7 p.m. on Friday evening. It is going to be a different style service. Be part of it. Come on out. We'll see you then. God bless you.